The Holy Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak in the name of the risen Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So take a deep breath. Your responsibilities are almost over. Just relax. I know it's a lot. It's always bated breath. I'm not sure if it's worse for you or your parents, to be perfectly honest. So a little bit of anxiety that's wrapped up in that. The design of the church, though, is not to hold on to that anxiety. It's to release it. Today is Holy Trinity Sunday. Uh, jokingly, amongst circles of priests, which, albeit are small and usually not very funny, uh, we say this is Heresy Sunday. Uh, because it's a Sunday where all sorts of priests get up and give all sorts of new and different analogies as to what the Trinity is and how it meets you. And all those th things usually tend out to be not quite right. Not quite right because we already know what is quite right. We already understand what the Trinity to be. Co-equals in co-unity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all working to meet us in unique and different ways for the opportunity of us. Those things, our God, remains static. Static. They stand still. And we, in that relationship, are dynamic because we must move and bob and weave and work our way back to God over and over and over again. That is our responsibility as Christians. Knowing, knowing that God will always be there and that God will always meet us where we seek him out. And so the question then becomes, how do we do that seeking? How do we find that experience of God? Well, in part, we find God in the sacraments. You've heard me say this before. God makes a specific divine promise to us that he will be present in the sacraments. So we find God there, certainly. And we find the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not only there, but reaching us in different ways and means throughout our lives. I know that um, when I was a young person, perhaps your age, Jesus was awfully important to me. Jesus Christ, I heard that name over and over and over again. As I get older, God the Father, different stages in our life, becomes more relevant. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit, who he's left for us uh, in this Pentecostal season as a harbinger uh, to remind us of the Spirit present amongst us. So we have now come to the end of 14 weeks of preparation from our Holy uh, Communion class. 14 weeks. And what have we learned? Go. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not, not going to do that to you. It's always interesting in these class sessions how much uh, we learn ourselves uh, as being part of it. Um, for me, uh, if you ever really want to know something well, prepare yourself to teach it. Uh, if you prepare yourself to teach it, you will know it backwards and forwards. That's, that's not to say, though, you won't receive a question that stumps you ever here, here and now. Um, and certainly some of those questions came about. But I want to speak a little bit about what it is that we believe uh, as Episcopalians about our participation in this service and what it is that we do. I know that over the years, Christianity has probably been viewed by a lot of people as being a pretty uh, ritualistic and specific experience of faith and practice, except to say that religion and our religion is, as Christians is one of the most flexible in the world because it's working to meet people and their culture and their experience in different ways. This expression of service that we participate in today uh, comes from an ancient Greek tradition of the symposium. Uh, it's not even all our own. A symposium where uh, People would gather together and you'd hear a wonderful famed orator. He'd come in and speak about philosophy or science, what have you. And then they'd participate in a community meal. Does it sound similar to what we're doing? What we did was we switched the orator out. We made that conversation religious. And then that sacred meal or that meal that we participated in was no longer agape but sacred and ritualistic. And we did that taking the traditions of the people and collecting them together. And the significance of that is found in the collecting, the bringing together, all for the purpose of joining in faith and in community because it's in faith 
and in shared faith and community that we find Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And so the historic tradition of the church would be that the priest would stand outside of the service as folks were coming in. He would greet uh, the people as they would come in. He would listen to some of the challenges that they were facing that week. And then that first prayer that we do, the collect, would be a collection of all those things. I pray for this person. I pray for that person. I pray for these challenges that we're facing. All these things, a collection of our prayers that come together, that speak to the commonality and the community with which we share. And then we participate in a little bit of learning, a little bit of scripture. In our tradition, we say scripture, reason, and tradition, right? We interpret it. We ask you to bring your minds in the door that you might participate in that opportunity. And then once that service of the word is over, we go right into communion. This sacred feast, not just a service of remembrance, it's not just a eulogy, right? It's not that. But it's an opportunity where we're worshiping together and we give notice. We realize that God is really present. And those two words are really important. Really present. Now, the Catholic Church and other uh, churches might use the uh, term real presence, and I would say they're very close, they're very similar. But, you know, we're Anglican, we have to be a little bit different, right? So we say really present, and it is to say that what we believe is that something mystical happens to the bread and the wine that we consume, that it becomes something unique and different, a sign and a symbol that points to something greater. And that our participation in that communion is an act of participating in God's grace, an extension of God, a static God that's continually reaching out to us over and over again. And the significance of using those two particular, three particular elements, what are the three elements that we use in communion? The bread, the wine, and the, this is the hard one. Water, right? The wine is representative of the grapes. The grapes representing uh, the harvest and the many people that come together, the work of human hands. All those grapes come together to make that wine. And the many grains, which also represent the people coming together uh, to make the bread. Again, made of human hands for our consumption. And so what we believe is on that cork roll, which is that it's a piece of cloth that sits upon the cross, or on the altar, that corporal, everything contained there becomes holy and blessed. The significance of that for us is that we believe it, it participates in a metaphysical change where it becomes something else. And I've said this to our class, but if you were to take that bread and that wine and put it under a microscope, it still looks like bread and wine. Right? That's what we believe. That's also what the Catholic Church believes. It still looks like bread and wine. It still is materially bread and wine. But it has been mystically altered to be something new and something exciting and something to imbibe us to bring us closer to Jesus Christ. And so that's what we sign up for. That's what we sign up for as Episcopalians, that we would give it that kind of reverence. And the significance of it, especially for me, the significance of it is we have a God that is so abundant that he is willing to be in such, such simple and perishable things. Think about that just for a moment. We have a God that's so abundant that he's willing to be in such simple and perishable things, things that can be thrown away. If we have too much communion, what do you think we do with it? We either eat it or drink it or we what? Commit it to the ground. We have a God that's so abundant for us that he's willing to even be put in a position where he would be cast to the ground because our God wants us so much, loves us so much, that he's willing to reach out in every way, shape, and form of everything he's created in the world that he might touch us and be near us and be close to us. Remember, God stays the same. We must move. And so my hope for you is that in your life, in your ministry, and in your work, because you do have a ministry, we are the priesthood of all believers. 
all of us ministers of the word, that you in your life would constantly find yourselves moving left and right, up and down, over and under, to find that new experience of Jesus Christ, a God that is reaching out to you each and every day in every single way imaginable. Amen. Amen. Amen.